We have bi-stability in the homoclinic case between a fixed point and a periodic orbit. Okay? And I'm going to allow the current to slowly vary. I is now a dynamic variable instead of fixed. Okay? Make sense? And I've laid it right here, V tilde. So let's see what happens in this case. Suppose I start, remember this is the IV axis. Suppose I start with I down here. Okay? I is below, when I is here, V is below V tilde. And so the IDT is V tilde minus V is going to start to increase. Everybody see that? Because right? V is less than V tilde. And remember, epsilon is, so I is changing really slowly. So it's like just oozing along here, all right? So what's going to happen is it's going to keep going here until it runs into here. Now, this is where um, I don't think the cultural exchange is going to work. But in, in the US, we have a cartoon called Roadrunner, all right? Some of you have heard of Roadrunner, all right? And Roadrunner is a bird, and there's a coyote that chases him, all right? And there's many scenes in that where the roadrunner is running, and he makes a quick turn, and the coyote keeps going, and he goes right over a cliff. And then he looks down, and he realizes, oh, nuts. Okay? So this is what happens, okay? The coyote is going around here, and suddenly there's a cliff, and there's nowhere to go. So the only place to go, there's no more attractors. There's no more stable stuff here. You have to go up to the limit cycle. Okay? So now, uh, V is going to jump up to here. Has to, because there's nowhere else to go. All right? But now, now you're going to start to spike periodically, right? Because that's the limit cycle. But you'll notice that V lies, the, limit, the maximum and minimum of the limit cycle lies strictly above V tilde, right? So now V is going to be bigger than V tilde, right? And what's going to happen is I is going to have to shrink, start decreasing, right? So you're going to go up here, spike repetitively, and slowly meander down, okay? Keep on down. What's going to happen is you're going to hit the homoclinic, okay? And then once you hit the homoclinic, there's no more limit cycle attractor, and you have to collapse back down to there. And we start the process all over again. So what do you see is this. Slowly meandering along, then suddenly you jump up. Burst, burst, burst. Period gets a little bit longer because we're getting close to the homo clinic. And then collapse down. Okay. Okay, now this is called a square wave. First, there, because if you look at the profile of it, it's sort of like a square wave, okay? Or you could call it a Bart Simpson burster, if you know who Bart Simpson is. It looks like Bart Simpson, too. Um, so, a Simpsonator, okay? So there's the bursting. This is the square wave bursting. And you can think of square wave bursting as the transition in the, um, it's a transition in the morris lecar equation or any kind of model like this where you've got bistability via a homoclinic bifurcation, this, this picture, okay? So can you think of another case that we studied where there was bistability? Remember the other case? That was with the subcritical Hopf bifurcation. Okay? So let's, let's look at that one, right? We'll do the same trick. Now, incidentally, 
you can do quite a bit of mathematical analysis. So what happens is you change V tilde, okay? If V tilde is down here, then you'll just stay at a fixed point all the time. I make this a little more curved. If you put V tilde there, then you just stay at the fixed point. It's, it'll go up there and it'll just stay there. And if you put V tilde, say up here, okay, then what's gonna happen? This is kind of cool, all right? So let's suppose we put V tilde up there. Then, what do you think will happen? Let's analyze, you know, crudely analyze, formally hand-waving, analyze what happens, okay? Remember, so, so, we have dv dt equals f of v and i n dt equals G of V N and Okay. So let's let's do a cool trick here. Okay, I'm gonna use something called the method of averaging. Okay. When we're up here, okay, when V tilde is up here. All right, we're going to be, um, let's see, do I want V? Yeah, I think I want V tilde up there. Um, yeah, when V tilde is up here, okay, I'm going to assume that that's going to push I out to a region where it's always oscillating, okay? Now we know if I is past here, there's always an oscillation. So let me write the, let me fix I, pretend I is now fixed, because epsilon's close to zero. I'm gonna fix I, and let's suppose that for that value of I, we have a V limit cycle. I'll call it um, v, v hat of T semicolon I, okay? So that's the limit cycle. And it's periodic, it has period capital T hat of I, right? So now let's feed that back into here. So for each I, we have this V hat of T semicolon I, which is a periodic oscillation. So let's feed that back into here, and now we have di dt, equals epsilon times V tilde hat of T semi. Okay? And this is periodic. Now there's a great theorem. Which I'll put over here. And we're gonna use this, I mean, We'll use something like this theorem later in class today. Theorem. Suppose we have a dynamical system differential equation like this, and f of x t plus T equals F of X T, okay? So it's periodic in this second variable. Then consider dy dt equals epsilon F bar of Y. the average of F over one period, okay? The theorem says that solutions to this 
And solutions to this are within order epsilon apart from each other. Up to t is like order one over epsilon, okay? In other words, the dynamics of this system are similar to the dynamics of the average system. And in particular, if the average system has a stable equilibrium point, then this system has a stable periodic, okay? So let's go back to that with that fear in hand. This is periodic. This is epsilon is small. So let's average it. Okay. Well, the average of that over one period, it's a constant. Minus. Okay. That's just the average of the voltage over one cycle. Okay. Make sense? Right. So here's the voltage. <laughs> voltage. Okay. So suppose that we can find an I. So remember, here's the, here's the voltage, okay? And if we choose V tilde right, <laughs> we can choose V tilde to, to be in a regime where, depending on what I is, the average of this voltage matches this, okay? And that means there exists a unique I <laughs> whose average is Average voltage corresponds to that, and this goes to a fixed point, right? So it gets stuck there, and it just fires repetitively. So down here, we get no spiking for V tilde. In here, we get this bursting, and up here, we get repetitive spiking. But there's a transition from bursting to repetitive spiking that's really, really complicated. Okay, and if you want to know what happens, you have to have a really big background in dynamical systems, and you have to read this paper by David Terman. Okay, um, I can't remember when the paper was written, but I will tell you that this transition here, there exists these things called smell horseshoes, and it's very complicated dynamical systems. There's theorems that go, the paper itself is, I think, 50 or 60 pages. And I'm not going to read it. I can't even read four page papers. I get everything from Facebook. Okay, so there is the square wave burster. And so if you choose this V tilde correctly, you can get um, bursting. Repetitive spike or rest. Okay? Transition from rest to re bursting is pretty easy. Okay? Just once you get past here, <laughs> you have to keep going. Okay? And all that's happening is as you get pa close to here, the, um, you get time between bursts is longer and longer. Okay? Okay, so that's the square wave burster. Let's take a look at what other condition, when else do we have, um, when else do we have, um, I lose my eraser again. Anybody see the eraser? Ah, there it is. Just hanging around my neck. Uh, v tilde uh, slightly up. You said the period huh? when we increase the V tilde slightly, uh, slightly up. You said the period between the bursting increases, right? So how does it increase? I'm sorry, can't. Oh, sorry, uh, I, it, it, it's on. I just yeah. couldn't. Yeah. Oh. So the V tilde as it increases, you said the period between the bursting increases, right? 
Uh, could you say how does it increase the period between the bur burstings? Oh, let's see. Does it? In actually, I don't know. I, I I don't know actually if it will increase. I thought it might, but let's see. Let's see what happens as uh, as we get close. I guess it doesn't. I think they just disappear. Yeah. I'm not sure what the bifurcation is that they dis disappear. It's probably complicated too. Anything that crosses a bifurcation like that's going to be complicated. Um, I don't do bursting for a living, but um, um, I don't know. Um, you can try this. It's a good, you can do this on your computer today. All right. So you take the Boris Lacar in this regime and then you write down this equation. This is real easy, too. You just choose your V tilde. See, once you have the bifurcation diagram, you'll know where to choose V tilde. Okay? So now, let's turn to the other case. Probably shouldn't have erased this because we're going to come back to that. Where else do we see bistability? We saw bistability. Sir, I have a question. Oh, oh. Sorry. What is the difference between bursting and spike? Huh? Because these are all the spikes, no? What is the difference between bursting and spike? I'm, I'm what, is, what is the difference between bursting and spiking? Oh, bursting. Oh, oh, repetitive spiking is just this. all the time, constant periodic spiking. Bursting has gaps. So one is and the other is OK? <laughs> Does that make sense? All right. Is, is that OK? Yes. OK. All right. So yeah, but here's the cool thing. And this is why, again, it's really helpful to use the computer this transition from bursting to repetitive spiking is very complicated, and you'll get like very aperiodic motion. You'll get chaotic behavior here. Okay. So now let's let's ask, what about the other case? Well, we have a subcritical hop. And then periodic orbit. Okay? And I've got to draw both sides of this, so I don't. OK, so there's the case where we have, this is the maximum of the voltage, this is the minimum of the voltage, and this is the um, periodic work. The unstable guy. Remember the case we had. Now, I'm drawing here voltage, voltage as a function of current. Okay, treating current as a parameter. So you could imagine if you somehow started here and chose v tilde so that. V tilde would stay up here, all right? Then dV dt or dI dt will be positive, and you'll start to go through here. And then once you get out here, this is not stable anymore. So you're going to have to start winding up until you hit this limit cycle. And now maybe the average of this spike is above V tilde. And that will cause you to start to go back down until you hit here. And now you can imagine you get a burster there, right? And let me draw what that should, the burst would look like is this is not a perfectly accurate description of what the burst looks like. This is sort of my depiction of it, okay? You'll notice that it's not as clean as this one. And the reason is because this is an unstable periodic orbit. I mean, this is an unstable equilibrium point, but you spiral into it. And 
it takes a while to decay back. And then as you go past, it takes a little while. This is a very complicated thing that's happening here. This is called slow passage through a hop bifurcation. People have studied this, and I don't want to go into any of the details of this, but you can stick around here for quite a long time before finally taking off, okay? And it depends on how long you were down, how close you were pressed down here before you take off, okay? This is a phenomena that's called a canard. Okay, because you're staying really close to something that's unstable before finally taking off. Okay, so this burster, how do we choose V tilde? Okay, because it's not clear. Here, it was very clear <laughs> that the voltage was always above here. So when you do the exercises today in XPP, one of the axes that you can look at is instead of voltage, you look at the average of the voltage. And if you look at the average of the voltage, it'll look roughly like, it'll kind of look like that, <laughs> okay? Just, just erase the bottom half. This is the average of the voltage. Obviously, the average is gonna be continuously deformed to the periodic orbit because this, I mean, to the fixed point, right? And then the average will look like this in that case, it's clear that you want to choose V tilde somewhere in here. If you choose V tilde up here, again, it's before, you're stuck in repetitive spiking. If you choose it down here, you're just stuck in equilibria. And if you stick it in here, you should get this weird elliptic bursting. But the transitions across these things is very complicated. And again, you get chaotic behavior. So this is called an elliptic burst. And the reason it's called an elliptic burst is because of its slope. Looks like an ellipse, okay? So this is called a square wave burster because of its em envelope. This is called an elliptic burster. So that takes care of the two of the three bifurcations we looked at, okay, right? So we have one more bifurcation that we looked at, and that was the um, SNCC. Now the SNCC, there was no bistability, right? So without bistability, it doesn't look like there's any way, how could we, if there's no bistability, can we get bursting from that? Do you have any suggestions on how we might get bursting from the SNCC? You have to think that one slow guy isn't gonna be enough. You need two slow guys. Okay, so I'm going to show you two slow guys, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to use the theta model instead of the morris lacar because remember the theta model is sort of like the normal form. That's the nice usual form for the saddle node infinite cycle bifurcation. Oh, one more thing before we do the, um, before I go on. Here, if you want to play with... Um, Oh, no, that, it's actually, yeah, it might work, yeah, yeah. If you want to play with a simple normal form, remember normal forms are these reduced models that are some sense equivalent to the full model, all right? So a normal form for subcritical hop bifurcation that has a stable big periodic orbit is this. There we go. So you take that, that equation, all right, and you write that down 
that guy, if P is your parameter, okay, and then you write P dot equals epsilon times, say, um, X tilde minus real Z or something like, or may, oh, no, no, here, I guess, rho tilde minus rho. Remember rho? Rho was the amplitude when you write this. Then you should be able to get an elliptic burster with this. <laughs> so I'll leave that as an exercise. Alpha should be positive. In fact, with loss of generality, I think you can probably make it one. Okay? So we'll just make it real easy. Okay? So this guy has, um, this guy can have unstable limits, stable limits, like, okay? I'll let you guys um, solve this for your own amusement. All right, so let's do the theta model with two variables. And I'm going to be winging it here, but because oh, I don't know the exact parameters, but it turns out to be a very useful thing anyway. So let's write down the theta model. Theta dot equals 1 minus cosine theta plus cosine theta times. So I'm going to introduce two slow variables. Okay? I'll call them x and y. All right? Okay. Let me think, what's the easiest way to do this? Yeah. A, <laughs> just the free parameter, plus BX minus CY. Okay, so X and Y will be our slow variables. And X dot equals epsilon, y dot equals epsilon, and I have to think about what the right function to put in here, okay? So bear with me, I think this will work. Minus x, minus y. I'm gonna put a tau in front of here, an additional time scale, because x and y might be not the same slowness, okay? Ah, here we go. This is real easy. I think, yeah. I think this will work. All right, maybe this will work. We'll, we're gonna, you're going to have to bear with me here. Here I'm winging it, all right? So this is the fate model, which is a SNCC with two slow variables, x and y, all right? Okay? And x and y obey Pretty simple dynamics that when the theta model spikes, remember the theta model spikes when it goes through pi. Okay? Remember that? So each time the theta model spikes, both x and y are incremented. Okay? So it's not such a simple linear thing anymore. Okay? But that's not surprising because you'd expect it to be some complicated nonlinear function because the theta model came as a transformation. Does this make sense? Is everybody with me? Is anybody with me? All right, so let's analyze this and see if we can get, see if we can get bursting out of this. Okay? It's so really, this, yes, you have a question? Did you have a question? Oh, okay, I thought you were, Okay, so A, B, and C are parameters.
So you can, and positive parameters. So you think of B as X as increasing the probability that this guy wants to spike. And Y decreasing the probability that wants to spike. You see that? When Y goes up, because remember, both of them grow whenever this neurons, whenever X or theta spikes. Okay? See that? So let's analyze this, and this is really cool. You'll, yeah, now it's going to work. I know it's going to work. I'm absolutely positive it's going to work. Okay? So what happens if X and Y, since epsilon is small, if epsilon is zero, x and y are constants, right? See that, dx dt? Yeah, right? And if x and y are constants, then this is just a constant, okay? So let me call that constant i, okay? Is everybody with me? All right. If x and y are fixed, then this is just a constant. If that constant is positive, then this guy will spike with a frequency of square root of i over pi. Right? Remember? And if it's, this i is negative, that it will spike with a frequency of, it won't spike at all, right? Everybody buy that? So let me write that the frequency of this frequency is square root of, how about that? So i plus means the positive part of i. So if i is greater than zero, this is our normal frequency. And if i is less than zero, the frequency is zero. It doesn't spike at all. Is anybody getting this or not? Somebody, OK, at least one person nods. All right, that's all I need, OK? All, right. all I need is one person laughing, and I'll keep joking. OK, yes. All right, so, so now this is really cool. If it's spiking, then it's periodic, right? Right? And we can apply our friend the averaging theorem to this. Well, what's the average of this over one spike? Yeah, this x and y are slow, so their average is constant, they're basically constant. What's the average of this over one spike? One over t, the integral um, delta of theta of t minus pi dt, okay, over one spike. That's just <laughs> equal to one over t, because it's a delta function and it only goes it's, theta is crossing pi only once. Um, technically, you have to divide by d theta dt at the spike, which means it's actually um, um, it's actually one over two t. <laughs> okay, that, that's a trick in delta functions. Okay, here, do you guys. And suppose that, suppose f of zero equals zero, okay? And f is differentiable and continuous, then this is equal to one, yeah, okay? So theta of t is gonna cross pi, d theta dt at pi is two, <laughs> right? Because at pi this is zero. <laughs> so, this is 1 over 2t. Well, what's t? 
One over, what's one over T? The frequency, right? So the averaged equations are x dot equals epsilon times minus x plus square root of Yeah, this is working out so nice, you'll see. This is so cool. A plus BX minus CY, positive part over 2 pi. Y dot, tau Y dot equals epsilon minus Y plus square root of A plus BX minus CY, positive part over 2 pi. So we've reduced this three-dimensional system to a two-dimensional system. Okay? And now, how do we solve the two-dimensional system? We draw the null lines for this. Right? This is a planar system. Now you're going to have to trust me <laughs> on this. I'm going to draw the null lines for this, for x and y. Now, this isn't generally the case, but I'm claiming that I can find null lines where this is. I can find parameters so that this is correct. The null lines for this system are x, y, turn out to look like this. Pretty cool. Okay? Okay. Oh, I. Y will be green, and X will be red. Okay. Okay. So the Y null line will look like this. Okay. And the X null line will look like this. Okay, and this is true if you pick A to be positive, all right, and B and C correctly, you'll get a phase plane that looks like this. And if you pick tau to be big enough so that the Y is even slower than the X, this is an unstable equilibrium point. And you'll get a oscillation around here. So x and y are periodically, and if you plot this thing as a function of t, you'll see it goes like this. It's negative, then it's positive, then it's negative, positive, negative. Okay. This is I of T. And that means that this guy is going to burst. Because he's getting periodic inputs, sometimes negative, sometimes positive. And he'll go, he goes like this. OK, so let's see what his burst looks like. Where'd my eraser go? What do his bursts look like? So let's look at it this way. Um, instead of drawing the lines, I'm going to draw the line in x, y, where a plus bx minus c, y is 0. OK? OK? So here's a line, and here, oh, it's a, it should be a straight line. <laughs> this is the line where a plus bx minus cy goes here, right? It's a straight line, okay? And the limit cycle looks like that, okay? Take it off the phase plane, I mean the null lines and stuff. 
This is a great little exercise to try and redo this. Find the parameters A and B and C and tau so that you get what I'm saying, okay? So look what happens, okay? So in this region, okay, this is the region where, let's see, this is, yeah, so this is I greater than zero, this is I less than zero. Like Y is real big, then I will be less than zero, and X is real big, Y will, I will be greater than zero. So as we're in here, we're going to be firing at faster and faster frequencies because I is getting bigger, farther away from this line. And then as we come around, we're going to slow down. Remember, because as I goes to zero, what's the frequency of the theta model? It goes to zero, right? And then it, down here, we'll just be at rest. Okay. And in that case, dx dt and dy dt, this won't be doing anything, right? Because the guy's not spiking anymore. And x and y will just be decaying, all right? But y decays more slowly than x. So we come around like this. And then eventually, if they both x and y decay because a is positive, we'll start to go again, right? So that's the intuition behind the limit cycle. And what does the burst look like? Okay. The burst does nothing, and then it starts to spike. Okay, so as we come in here, it's going to be really low frequency because we're right near the transition. Remember, the frequency is like square root of i. And then it's going to speed up, and then it's going to slow down again. Okay? And if you draw, and then the burst is going to do the same thing again, okay? over and over again. If you draw the timing between these guys, that's called the inner spike interval. Okay? If you draw the inner spike interval of this, what does that look like? Spike to spike. Draw the inner spike interval. It's big, then it gets smaller. So this is spike number. Spike one, spike two, three, and so on. So spike one, interval one, Two, three, four, okay? Interval between spikes. So it gets long, shorter, 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 then gets long again. Okay? You see that? why that is or not? Does anybody see that the timing between these spikes is going to get shorter? So if I plot that against interval number, I'll get something that looks like this. And that's why this is called a parabolic burster. Okay? <laughs> because the inner spike interval is parabolic. This one's square wave because of its shape. The other one was elliptic because of its shape. This one's parabolic because of the inner spike interval. Okay? We didn't name them. Okay? They were named before. So people that do, anybody here do PDEs, partial differential equations? All right. So you always, they always ask me, these guys say, well, you got a parabolic burster, you got an elliptic burster, what's a hyperbolic burster, right? And, and there isn't one. Okay. So we'll call the square wave the hyperbolic one because, I don't know, because it's a saddle, right? And saddles sort of look like hyperbolas. Okay, so that's all I want to say about bursting. Okay, so bursting, in fact, about um, 15 years ago, 
Yes. Uh, oh, and then this topic. Mm hmm. Just give you a mic. Oh, uh, the mic. DJ Day. Okay. Uh, <laughs> speak loudly. Right. Your mouth. Uh, in in this I value, instead of using a plus b x minus c y, can't I use a sinusoid? Like so, when the well, sine put a sinusoid in there. Yes. So like, and then it'll burst. But that's cheating because you're kind of imposing it, right? Okay. Right? So I want to have it emerge from the whole system. I see, okay. Yeah, because it's easy to take like this guy and just let I vary and it'll go <laughs> But that's cheat no not it's cheating, right? Right, because you're you're giving it, you know, it's sort of the God explanation or something. God did it. All right, that's the sinusoid, okay? It doesn't emerge naturally from all the interactions. Okay. I don't know if that's, maybe I shouldn't say that. Gotta be careful about religion. Okay. All right. So, in about 15 years ago, Eugene Isakiewicz wrote a paper, okay? It has amazing, gorgeous billions of illustrations, okay? In this paper. And this paper was, um, it classified all the different possible bursts. Okay, so we've shown three bursts. Eugene's paper has the other 125. Okay, <laughs> so it, it just depends on what kind of bifurcation you're going through. There's all kinds of bursters that have now gained popularity. There's the top hat burster, and there's uh, all these crazy bursters. Okay, but so there's people that like them. Right. Yeah, I mean, they're fine, I, but, but they're not my um, cup of tea. Um, I know the people that do um, insulin and, I mean, the, the, um, the pancreatic cells, they burst. Um, a lot of, these, these guys were named by neurophysiologists without knowing the mechanism. So this is called a square wave burst because it looks like a square wave. And that was the one that looks like that, it's called a parabolic burst. These are actually seen. Elliptic bursters are seen in, in sleep and, and certain cells um, in the brain stem. So these are all seen, okay? So now, um, in setting up for tomorrow, I wanna start talking about networks now. Because we've only done one cell. And the brain's got more than one cell, it's got lots of cells. And so we want to start talking about hooking these cells up, all right? And so the first thing I'm going to talk about is hooking them up, um, hooking up simple, small networks of oscillators, okay? And to do that, I'm going to develop some theory. But before we do that, I want to talk about modeling how neurons talk to each other. So how do we model how neurons talk to each other? Here's a neuron, and here's a neuron, and this guy is going to talk to this guy. Remember, I, sh I drew this picture um, yesterday, okay? This is a synapse, okay? And You can make these synapses quite complicated, and you can make the geometry very complicated, but we're going to make things really simple, okay? Let me call this V1, and let me call this V2, okay? And the equation I'm going to write down is C dV2 dt equals Okay, 
So C D V2 D is I'll put a two here, I guess. Okay. C D V2 D equals minus I ionic, and we've seen what that is. That's the G L V minus E. Remember, that's what we've been doing. That's all the currents from the channel intrinsic to the neuron. Okay. Plus applied stuff. I don't want to put it two because you'll think it's squared. So this is the stuff that you apply. For example, your sinusoid. <laughs> if you want to apply a sinusoid or constant current, okay? Or noise or something like that, right? And then I sin, okay? You're better to put the two down there. I sin two, okay? So I sin is going to be, the way we're going to model I sin is as follows. Okay? It's going to be modeled just like another voltage gate, voltage. It's going to be um, modeled as just like another conductance, another channel. Okay? So I sin 2 is G sin 2. S1 of T. Well, let me put a minus sign to be consistent. Okay, so just put that minus sign in there. Okay, so it's modeled just like we've seen exactly the same as our other channels. Remember? G times some gating variable times a reversal potential. Do you remember that? But the difference is, do you remember in the, the ionic channels, this gating variable depends on V2. Here, it depends on V1. So whenever V1 fires, this guy will go up. So you can include delays. People often like to include a time delay from the time it takes this guy to spike to, for the synapse to reach here, all right? Time delays are really important, and they are horrible as dynamical systems because they're infinite dimensional. And so we will never put delays in unless we're just simulating because we like finite dimensional systems. <laughs> if you want to deal with delays, you deal with them. I don't like them, okay? I don't do delays. Okay, so how do I model S1? There's lots of different models. So I'll give you a couple of them, okay? The simplest one Oh, here, I guess. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just. Yeah. Okay. Or maybe even, um, yeah, I'll just write F of V1. And F of V1 is zero until V1 spikes. And then when V1 spikes, F gives synapse a big jump, jerk, it gives it a big pulse. Okay? And then it decays with some time constant. Okay? So synapse will look, here's V1, and here's S1. Okay? Not the same scale. Right? Another way you could model it is.
That's a nice way to do it too. Then it looks more like a channel. And this would be, or let me write it like this. Okay, so this, when this, this gives you F alpha of V again is maybe alpha of V will look like like that, okay? So down here is V rest, and this is up close to V equals zero or something, so this only hap this is alpha of V. This only happens when V spikes, okay? And then when V spikes, you can see that S gets pushed up towards one, and then it decays again. So it'll still look like something like that, okay? So this is more like your classic channel. This is how I usually model these. That keeps S bounded between zero and one, okay? So this is how you couple neurons. This is a simple way to couple neurons. There's people that do all kinds of other things, but this is, this is the simplest way to couple neurons together. So now you can generalize this. If you have 100 neurons, you can make a network of them, and this guy now is going to be, so then we could have something along the lines of um, Okay? So in other words, the synaptic input into neuron J is the sum of the maximum conductances of the neurons from K to J times the synapse um, coming from neuron K times Vj minus reversal potential. Now I haven't said anything about E, the reversal potential. So for excitatory synapses, E sin is zero millivolts, okay? So remember, the neuron's at minus 60, so it's going to push it up towards zero, okay? That makes sense? And this is typical for what's called um, glutamate glutamate synapses, okay, or AMPA, and the transmitter is glutamate, okay, and AMPA is the name of the receptor, okay, and for inhibitory, it ranges quite a bit, but typically minus 70 millivolts, okay, for inhibitory guys. Or minus, it's close to rest, maybe a little less negative than rest, okay? So what that does is brings you down closer to rest and maybe even a little below rest, okay? And these are typical for GABA, okay? What's interesting is in development, in early development, um, e sin can actually be up to minus 50 or minus 40. In other words, for, for inhib so-called inhibitory synapses, during development, they can actually be almost excitatory. Okay? So with this, and I typically will take for alpha V, Something like that, okay? <laughs> In other words, when V gets close to zero, okay, then this rapidly goes to one, or maybe some, some parameter I'll call it, um, okay? So 
So when V gets big, when V spikes, remember V is typically at minus 60. So at minus 60, this is basically zero. You see that? Because this is E to the 30th. E to the 30th is big. <laughs> One over E to the 30th is zero as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and then when V gets close to, you know, when V spikes up to like 50 millivolts, this is zero and alpha goes to alpha bar. So this is a nice saturating function. These, these numbers are, you know, the most general is something like that, okay? Uh, just determine whatever your, depends on the neuron, how big the spikes are and things like that, okay? So this is typically how I model synapses and how many people, many other people model synapses. Okay, now that we have synapses and we have neurons, now we gotta glue them together and make networks. So now I'm going to have to, um, let's see, we have 12 minutes. I'm gonna start to introduce some, some mathematical Con concepts here. Because what I want to do, I'm going to spend the first half of tomorrow, I want to spend on um, weakly coupled oscillators, okay? Because you could do a lot with them, right? And there's, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do. And I want to develop the theory a little bit today, all right? So, to do that, I want to start thinking about oscillators more abstractly. Okay. So I want to give you kind of a nice geometric flavor of this, and then we'll do the analysis tomorrow. But the analysis, this is the stuff I'm going to be talking about is fairly abstract, okay? I'm going to be talking about inner products in function spaces, okay? But you can ignore all of it, okay? Because you, you're gonna get a formula, okay? And in XPP, you push U, A, A, U, A, H, and you're done, <laughs> okay? You just, you don't have to know any functional analysis, okay? You just push a few buttons and you'll get what we're gonna talk about. So here's the idea. Suppose I have an oscillator. Okay, so I have an oscillator, it's periodic. And I'm gonna define the phase of the oscillator. Time since last spike. Okay, so the phase, let's say it's zero, T, two T, three T. So I define phase zero to be the time at which the neuron spikes, okay? Now, if you're not talking about neurons, you're talking about, have you guys heard of circadian rhythms? That's, there's a bunch of cells deep in your brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and it gets input from your eyes, and it detects the amount of light, and it entrains you to the sun. So I haven't quite entrained yet, <laughs> but because I've been here only about four or five days, it takes a long time. Nine hours is the, wor the hardest time distance to entrain the human circadian oscillator, and that's exactly where I am. <laughs> From, from you guys, all right? So here's the point, all right? So, so phase, is the, phase is really essentially time. Now people often define it between zero and two pi. That's fine because you think of phase, but I'm gonna define it between zero and t, okay? So if I say the neuron is at phase t over two, it means it's exactly halfway between spiking. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come along 
and I'm going to perturb my neuron by a, a brief pulse, okay? okay? So I'm going to come along and give it a pulse. What's that going to do? It's going to change the timing of the next spike. Okay? So let me draw what it would look like after the perturbation. Suppose I gave it a perturbation and it made it spike early. Okay? Then if the neuron is very strongly attracting, in other words, you really want to be on that limit cycle, then it'll just maintain that same thing without any further input. Okay? Do you see that? So this is capital T. Let me call this T hat. Okay? That's the time of that spike given that I perturbed it at phase phi. Okay? So I given the perturbation at phase phi. And I get a T hat. So if I gave it at a different time, that, the, that would change the time of the spike also by a different amount. Maybe if I give it really close to after the spike, it'll actually delay the spike, okay? So I'm going to define something called the phase resetting curve, or phase transitions curve first. Phase transition curve is new phase versus, I'm going to do the phase resetting curve. I like that. Phase resetting curve. Okay? Also called PRC. Not the People's Republic of China, but the phase resetting curve. Okay? And I'm going to write delta of phi equals t minus t hat of phi. Okay. Now sometimes people will divide this by capital T, but I'm not going to do that. They'll divide it by capital T and multiply by 2 pi, but I'm not going to do that. So what does this tell us? It tells us if capital delta is positive, it means t was less than t. It shortened the spike. It means I sped the neuron up a little bit. Do you understand? I sped it up. I made it go faster because it spiked earlier. So I made it faster by an amount delta. If t hat is less than phi, then delta is negative. So delta is telling me how much the neuron speeds up or slows down when it receives an input. So if delta is something that can be experimentally measured in neurons and in brain, in, in circadian rhythms and in many other oscillatory things. Remember the story I told you early, earlier this morning about the guy, he was trying to measure phase resetting curves in his heart and he gave too big of a perturbation and died, okay? So the phase resetting curve is, is uh, telling us how much an impulse advances or delays the time of the spike. So now you can start to see why this would be useful if you start to couple neurons. Yes? The guy who gave the, uh, so his heart never started again, right? Yeah, he, he perturbed it too strongly. So the spike might never come again? It never came again, yeah. <laughs> so T hat was infinite. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> but now, now that was that, that you know, don't, we, we aren't going to do that kind of perturbation. We're going to do small perturbations, okay? So you can imagine that this, what this does depends a lot on the amplitude of the perturbation, too. 
right? So we can include the amplitude in here. Say this is the amplitude or the total charge you inject in a current. We can include the amplitude there, okay? You want, and that's, so now, of course, if the amplitude goes to zero, delta goes to zero, right? Everybody buy that? So I'm going to define something else. Infinitesimal phase reserve curve is the limit as A goes to zero of delta of phi semicolon A divided by A. Okay. So those of you who do calculus, you know that um, you have to write it as a limit because it's zero over zero. Okay? And that'll give you some function. Right? Now here, I've only talked about injecting a current, which means I'm only in I'm, I'm only affecting the voltage, right? Now, experimentally, that's the only thing you can do. But uh, mathematically, we could also jiggle the end variable, for example, in the morris lecar right? There's no reason why you couldn't put a perturbation of that in, right? So for each variable in your oscillator, you actually have one of these for each variable, because depending on what variable you hit, it will change the timing of the spike. So for example, if you hit N, it might, if you increase N, it might delay the spike, right? Because if N is bigger, it slows, you know, it's a potassium one, it might slow down the spike, okay? So does that make sense? So in fact, for each variable in your system, you've got the infinitesimal, I'll call this z of phi, and z of phi is actually a vector for each, one for each quantity, okay? One for each, so, so there's a voltage one, there's an n1, in the, in the Hodgkin-Huxley equations, there's an m1 and an h1, okay? There's one for each of those. The only one we really ever care about is the one with voltage because that's how synapses talk. So do you see what I mean? For each variable in your system, you can perturb it, and we'll perturb it and it'll change. We have an oscillation, you perturb it and it has, it shifts the timing of the spike, okay? So let me geometrically, um, well, I only have 31 seconds, so I won't. Okay, so I think I'll stop here. Okay. So the point is that we've got this vector z, and that's one of the buttons you can push in XPP to compute, okay? Because it's an infinitesimal thing. So if you try and do it on your computer, it's gonna be a pain in the neck. You'll make a little perturbation and then divide. But it turns out that this satisfies a very simple differential equation. And I'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay? Oh, why? Huh? Oh, 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 okay. All right. So let me give you some. Oh. I was watching the clock as you guys were. <laughs> okay. I know you're anxious to get to that delicious food. Okay, well let me let me give you a little geometric picture here of a limit cycle too. Okay, I want to find another concept, and I'm going to relate these things. Okay, so let's recall the infinitesimal phase resetting curve is the phase resetting curve for a stimulus as the stimulus goes to zero, and there's one for each variable, okay? Does that make sense? 
So now I want to give you a geometric picture. That's, that's sort of an experimental point of view. Let me give you a geometric picture. I have a limit cycle. Okay? And this is phase zero. That's when the neuron spikes. Okay? And the phase, maybe phase T over two might be down here. Maybe. Okay? Because maybe if you're near a saddle node, bifurcation, it spends most of its time here. Remember, I'm just drawing the curve here. If you draw constant time things, it might be really fast here. And then really slow there. Okay? So think of phase not as the geometric phase on a clock, but remember phase is time. Okay? So let's suppose that I start with an initial condition off the limit cycle. Oh, so first of all, it's really clear on the limit cycle what the phase is. So if I'm at this point, I know exactly what the phase is because it takes this much time to get there. Okay? Everybody clear on that? On the limit cycle, the phase is very well defined. But can you define phase off the limit cycle? So what do I mean by phase off the limit cycle? Here's a way to think about it. Suppose I start with a off the limit cycle, okay? So what's going to happen? This limit cycle is stable and it's attracting. It's going to suck this guy in, okay? So I'm going to draw his trajectory. And eventually, it's going to be pulled into the limit cycle. So I'm going to plot at this point, I'm going to solve his, I'm going to integrate him forward in time for exactly one period. Okay? So maybe after one period, he's here. Okay? You see what I mean? Okay, so remember, after one period, the phase is the same as you started. Now I'm going to integrate him for a sec another period, and maybe he's here. Okay, I'm going to integrate it for a third period, and he's closer and closer. Okay, eventually he's going to be right there on the limit cycle, and that defines his phase. So this gives me a curve. Every point that starts on this after one period, so if I start another point on here, After one period, I'll be here on the same green line. So this is the curve of asymptotic phase, all right? And this has a name. This is called the isochrone. Iso means same, chrome, time. So this is the isochrone for this phase. And so you can draw isochrones through every phase. Okay? Every phase has a unique isochrone. Okay? And now I'm going to relate this to the infinitesimal phase resetting curve, okay? So what does this mean? The isochrone is a map from R2 to the circle, okay? 
So any point, well, in some subspace of R2, whatever the basin of attraction. For example, with the dead guy, <laughs> there wasn't anything in here, okay? The isochrones all died on here. <laughs> I mean, they probably twist around like crazy here. It's probably really complicated there. Okay. Okay. In fact, even near a fixed point, um, the isochrones get all twisty too, as you can imagine. It's very complicated to compute these accurately. Art Winfrey was the one that invented the concept of isochrones. So isochrones are asymptotic phase. It tells you what phase you'll go to. So these are not trajectories. Don't confuse them with trajectories. It's just if I start on initial condition here, and then I integrate four for one period, I come back to this curve, okay? So, this is a map of some neighborhood of the limit cycle that takes, so theta takes Let's say this is um, NV, again, we'll use NV as a good example, takes VN into asymptotic phase theta. Okay? Okay? Does that make sense? So, Here's a really cool thing. For z of theta, for z of phi, remember z is a vector, right? Remember what z was? It's the infinitesimal phase resetting curve for each of the n variables, for each of the variables. The z of phi equals the gradient of theta. Remember, theta is a function of the n variables, okay? So the gradient will produce a vector, right? Remember the great gradient of a function of n variables is df dx1, df dx2 is a vector. Evaluated at evaluated at the limit cycle. Okay? In other words, Remember, we said the infinitesimal phase resetting curve, it was just perturbing in a little tiny bit. It's basically taking the gradient of this as we get close to the limit cycle. So it's a linearized approximation of the isochron. Yeah? It's a linear approximation of that isochron. Yeah? So that turns out to be what the asymptotic phase is. And there's some nice, ex you can prove this, it's pretty easy to prove. I probably am not gonna spend the time proving it. So all this is setting us up for weak coupling, all right? So how do you, comp so isochrones, I said, are really hard to compute. And this looks like it'd be a pain in the neck to compute. So we have to figure out how to compute Z, okay? So there's a couple ways I can do this, but I think the easiest thing for now is I'm going to state what z is. I'm going to set it up in the sense of function spaces a little bit. Or no, no, let me, let, let me, in fact, I'm going to probably stop here. But before I stop here, I want to remind you of a little linear algebra. Has everybody here had some linear algebra? Yes? Okay. OK. 
Okay? I want to solve AX equals B. Okay? When can I solve AX equals B? I can solve AX equals B. Do you guys remember, do you guys, are you familiar with the term the range of an operator? Yes? Thumbs up? The range of A is all guys, so, so A is taking some space, um, I'll say R in into R M, okay? The range of A is the set of all X in R M such that there exists a Y in, oh here, I'll just write it like this. Range of A is just Just everything that gets mapped. If A is zero, then the range of A is just zero. Okay? If N and M are equal and A is invertible, then the range of A is all of the, the whole space. Okay? How about null space? Have you heard of the null space? I know this guy has because he knows about zero eigenvalues. <laughs> So the null space is AX equals zero. It's a set of guys such as that, all right? So the fundamental theorem of linear algebra is that the range of A is equal to the null space of A, the orthogonal complement of the null space of A star. That's the fundamental theorem of linear algebra, okay? And I guess, I got, yeah, I got two minutes. All right. So I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because it's, it's pretty abstract. And the only reason I use it is to derive the weak coupling equations. OK? So maybe I should just throw out that stuff um, and just, yeah, I, 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 I just want to say it so that it was said. All right? Do you guys know what the dot product is? Yeah. It's also called an inner product. And there's a generalization of the inner product for function spaces. Okay? And generalize anything. Math, that's what we do, mathematicians. Although remember, I said I was a poser, I'm a biophysicist. But, but I, I, I'm a biophysicist who knows a lot of math. <laughs> so anyway, inner product. I'll just write like this, x, y, okay? If, it's, if x and y are in Rn, it's just x dot y. If x and y are complex, then it's x conjugate dot y, okay? Okay, A star, <laughs> A star is called the adjoint of the linear operator A. And it's defined as X A Y is A star X Y, okay? So, for example, if A is just a real N by N matrix, a star is just the transpose of it, okay? If A is the dif differentiation with respect to T, <laughs> and your inner product is an integral over some period T, then A star is minus D by DT. Okay, and you get that by, you guys know integration by parts. So, anyway, so, so, what this says is the range of the linear operator is the orthogonal, orthogonal, remember two vectors are orthogonal if their inner product is zero. So what this says is AX equals B has a solution
if and only if has a solution if and only if u star inner product would be is zero where a star u star is zero. U star is in the null space of a star. That's all it says. Okay? And all right, now it's time to stop. So now it's time for that delicious lunch. Okay. So tomorrow we're going to use this. This is this theorem is the most important theorem in all of applied mathematics. Because whenever you do perturbation theory, you end up having to use this. Okay? It's just a great the averaging theorem, believe it or not follows from this theorem, okay? Everything follows from this. It's also called the Fred Holm Alternative Theorem, okay? But it's such a great theorem. Probably my favorite theorem. I use it more than anything else. Do you guys have a favorite theorem? Nah, everybody should have a, you know, Implicit function theorem or the hop bifurcation theorem. Prime number theorem. Maybe some of you guys are more pure. All right. So I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>